sorry son, I didn't hold up a sign for the first one, but this is the second one on the veil. Second lecture on the veil. We begin with Danian Brinkley in Secrets of the Light. And I'm beginning my quote on page 180. But let's think about this. Over six billion people have left heaven in our lifetime alone. Each of these souls end up in the right body, in the right family, in the right country, although I have to admit that my family often wondered why I had come for, where I had come from and why on earth they had to be put up with me. According to divine protocol, all souls entering heaven from the physical realm as well as those souls ready to ship out of heaven are classified and categorized according to their level of consciousness and final destination. These impeccable ports of exit and entry are located directly between the present physical reality and the cosmic territory territories of the beyond. Now, I would call those portals, uh, perhaps veils, might apply here. Our experience at the Divine Clearing House is like a gentle cosmic cleansing. Quite specifically, we are calibrated to the vibrational frequency of mental innocence that acts to clear our minds temporarily of all memories unnecessary in the upcoming life. That's the veil. One of the reasons for living within the physical plane is to learn, grow, and mature spiritually into a state of unconditional love. If we have full knowledge and memory of all that we are, and everything we have ever done, the work we have to do on earth now could be undermined. <clears throat> Our focus might be distracted by glimpses of the past, causing our present missions to suffer due to lack of attention. Therefore, the veil of forgetting is a divine dispensation. As the process of departure from the world before unfolds, we cross through the veil of forgetting to commence a pristine lifetime. However, we are born into the world with cellular memory encoded with specific triggers. Over the course of our lifetime, these sparks of spiritual intelligence prompt the soul to reclaim and develop its talents. The timing of the release of these cosmic memories is careful, carefully calculated to occur with precision. When the soul realizes a sufficient degree of accomplishment on one level, more soul memory is freed from the subconscious in order to propel soul growth to the next level. I'll give you one of my biases. I think that what we are learning from near-death experiencers as well as from revelation from prophets and the scriptures and inspiration uh, from the Holy Ghost. These are all designed to help us move on to higher levels even while we're here on the earth. In the University of Life we progress from one level or grade to the next in succession. However, 
as it often happens, a student may have to repeat a grade, maybe even more than once, before perfecting any given lesson. In the heart of spirit, it does not matter. All lessons will be learned in perfection sooner or later. Spirit has only two opinions of our spiritual progression, good and very good. Spirit, uh, uh, I believe he's referring to God here. Even our mistakes serve to make us stronger and wiser. Thus the wheel of life continues to turn until the soul completes its earthly assignment. This could take one day or one hundred years. Each soul and every mission is unique. Let me assure you that every one of us will wind up exactly where we are supposed to be at the end of our lives, no matter what. The divine plan has made allowances for every unforeseen contingency we could possibly throw at it. That's an interesting view. And he gives us more. <clears throat> this comes from page 200. As a result of my many years in hospice work, I have found a highly effective system of transdimensional communication. Fortunately for all of us, it is also very simple. You see, our success in making contact with departed loved ones is predicated upon our motivation for wanting to do so. If we are inspired by selfishness, greed, anger, or guilt, chances are we will fail in our attempt to reach those in the hereafter. Negativity holds no place or power in the higher realms. In order to successfully lift the veil between the worlds, a spirit of love and celebration needs to lead the way. A spirit of joy and lightness will bridge the gap between here and the afterlife far more quickly than a spirit of concern or sorrow. Concentrating on the love and laughter we shared with the one we wished to contact is the key to our success. The higher realms and surrounding dimensions can feel the vibrations quality, the vibratory quality of the energies we project. Love and light are able to penetrate all levels and dimensions, grief, guilt, and anger are heavy energies that only tend to thicken as they leave the physical realm. Thus they fall short of the mark, never reaching the higher realms. You can empower yourself to reach a loved one beyond the veil First, be patient with this process, for it takes time and practice to perfect. And he talks about it here in his book, but I'm not going to go into that. In many ways, this practice is similar to those steps followed in the panoramic life review. The major difference is a conscious change in your intention. I suggest sitting quietly either at sunrise or sunset, because the veil between the worlds is the easiest to penetrate at dawn and dusk. And he goes on with some very interesting observations. Okay? <coughs> the Eternal Journey by uh, Craig R. Lundahl and Howard A. Woodison. Nothing on the cover. <coughs> okay. 
These two authors have this to say on page 128 and 129. So exactly how far they went and where they went in relation to the physical earth is unknown. Did they go light years or did they just pass into a different dimension? The only thing consistently reported was that their passage took them through something. They were kind of summarizing some of their research here. Those who had made the trip had given us many clues about the location and internal divisions of the other world. For example, Daisy Irene Dryden was born in Maryville, California on September 9, 1854 and died in San Jose, California on October 8, 1864, aged 10 years and 29 days. In the summer of 1864, she was attacked by a bilious fever. During the last three days of her life, she lingered on the borderland of this world and the next. Here's a quote. Two days before she left us, the Sunday school superintendent came to see her. She, Daisy, talked very freely about going and sent a message by him to the Sunday school. When he was about to leave, he said, Well, Daisy, you will soon be over the dark river. After he had gone, she asked her father, what he meant by the dark river. He tried to explain it, but she said, It's all a, mis all a mistake. There is no river. There is no curtain. There is not even a line that separates this life from the other life. And she stretched out her little hands from the bed and with a gest gesture said, Gesture. It is here, and it is there. I know it is so, for I can see you all, and I see them there at the same time. When asked if she saw a heavenly city, she said, I do not see a city. And a puzzled look came over her face, and she said, I do not know. I may have to go there first. When asked by her mother, How do you see the angels? She replied, I do not see them all the time. But when I do, the walls seem to go away, and I can see ever so far, and you couldn't begin to count the people. Some are near, and I know them. Others I have never seen before. Once, when her mother was sitting by her bedside, her hand clasped with Daisy, looking up so wistfully, she said, Dear Mama, I do wish you could see Owley. He is standing beside you. Involuntarily, she looked around, but Daisy continued, He says that you cannot see him, because your spirit eyes are closed but that I can, because my body only holds my spirit, as it were, by a thread of life. And that thread of life is often called the silver cord, and we will have a lecture on that. It's mentioned in the scriptures, the silver cord. And uh, several near-deathers have mentioned so here's this 10-year-old girl sitting in a room with her parents, and she's seeing both worlds at the same time. And that happens frequently. Dr. Lerma's two books, Learning from the Light and Into the Light, talk about that frequently as he visits with his patients. Okay. The Journey Beyond Life. The authors are Michelle R. Sorensen and David R. Wilmore. I pass but a short distance from my body through a film. 
in the world of spirits. This was my first experience after going to sleep. I seemed to realize I had passed through the change called death, and so refer to it in my conversations with the immortal beings with whom I became immediately in contact. I readily observed their displeasure of the use of the word death and the fear which we attach to it. They use another word in referring to the transition for mortality, which word I do not yet I do not now recall. I can only approach its meaning as the impression was left upon my mind by calling it the new birth. My first visual impression was the nearness of the world of spirits to the world of mortality. The vastness of this heavenly sphere was bewildering to the eyes of a spirit. Many enjoyed unrestricted freedom as to both vision and action. The veg There are some, and we'll have another lecture on space and, and vision in space. They can see light years clearly as if I'm reading the words of this book. That's one of the powers of the senses that come after we pass through the veil. Many en uh, enjoyed unrestricted freedom as to both vision and action. The vegetation or landscape was beautiful beyond description. Not all green, but gold and various shades of pink, orange, and lavender as the rainbow. A sweet calmness pervaded everything. The people I met there I did not think of as spirits, but as men and women. <coughs> Excuse me. Self-thinking, self-acting individuals going about important business in a most orderly manner. There was perfect order and everyone had something to do and seemed to be about their business. That's the end of Lecture 2 on the Veil.